and on. Smokers. What the hell? Who spotted us? Sound it! Sound it! Sound it! Sound it! Sound it! We have enemy ships in sector 47. It's a trap! Welcome to the Mad Max Minute presents Waterworld H2O Minutes at a Time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we're talking about Minutes 103 and 104, which begin with the Mariner sniffing his palm and end with Helen and Enola dashing to the starboard side. Our special guests this week, which I'm so excited for, we have Sarah Jones and Samantha Carter from Bigfoot for Breakfast. Hi, we're really happy to be here. Hey, so we're just part of a kind of a conspiracy missing persons podcast ufos all that good stuff so it fits right in right yeah i looked at the minutes for today and i said oh wow look at all those dead bodies and i just recently actually now that i think of it it's been quite a while that i've been listening to bigfoot for breakfast and i thought that's pretty gruesome i bet sarah and samantha would like to talk about that and so i contacted you and luckily you responded (laughs) Oh, yeah, we'd love to talk about gruesome. Yeah. (laughs) I also have a mild obsession with Kevin Costner, so we both do. (laughs) Excellent. That fits in so well. I historically have not listened to Bigfoot for breakfast, but when Rick said, hey, let's have these ladies on, I think it's a good fit, I sampled some episodes. First of all, I really enjoyed your podcast. I love conspiracy theories. So much fun. Love it. One of the first episodes I listened to, it was... Something about early European settlers in the United States and like very, very like the first ones. And they had built a wall around their settlement and they got scared. And so they hung some of their dead bodies on the outside of the wall to bolster their numbers and make it look like they had more people defending their settlement than they really did. Yeah. And that was the very first episode that I ever listened to. I'm like, that's exactly (laughs) what we have here. Waterworld took a page straight out of the Book of the Puritans. Yes. And that was our Happy Holiday episode, I believe. Oh, (laughs) jeez. Happy Thanksgiving. (laughs) Yes, yes, it was. Yes, it was. I remember that. (laughs) Yes. So let's get down to brass tacks for this episode. We start off with Kevin Costner. Last week, he reached his hand down into the water and he scooped up a bunch of black stuff and Always a good idea when you've scooped something strange out of the ocean to immediately press it to your face in order to get a good scent for it. I think that's good rule of thumb. Any situation straight from the ocean to your face can't go wrong. <laughs> I'm a taste tester myself. <laughs> <laughs> so you're on board with this. <laughs> it grosses me out. Samantha's daughter has a history of picking up things and immediately sniffing them. It's been like this long standing joke in our family that everything she picks up, she sniffs it. So I feel like it's all Sam. Sam would definitely smell and taste anything from the ocean. She must get it from somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, as grossed out as I am, it's not a bad thing. You can learn a lot about something from how it smells. And if you're brave enough, how it tastes. <laughs> so somebody's got to do it. Isn't that how we discovered penicillin? No, no, no. It wasn't penicillin. There's at least one artificial sweetener like aspartame, that category of artificial sweetener, where chemist was doing some stuff, didn't wash his hands, touched his mouth, goes, oh, that's sweet. So we have a long history of, I don't know, check it out. See what it's like. Put it in your face. (laughs) Historically, they would taste test the urine to make sure it wasn't sweet and that's how you would detect blood sugar for diabetics there you go long history of taste testing (laughs) and and apparently we have a long future of it too yeah it's strangely appropriate people tasting pee for sweetness for diabetics and here in waterworld drinking pee for sustenance (laughs) Yep. (laughs) like tasting the dirt for salt yeah helen has her hands on the spyglass that the Mariner was using last week, and she takes a quick peek at this trading outpost here. And we don't 
see that many people up on the top platform and we see a bunch of folks strapped to the bottom of the tower. And I want to duck into the novelization real quick to get a bit more depth on this situation. She plucked the binoculars from his hand and had another look. She could see the traders waving, yes, but there was something odd about it. Something wrong. Then she swung her view down to the bobbing box-like structures and saw that they were cages. And in those cages, clutching the bars, much as the mariner had been when he was dangling over the organo barge, were pitiful, shabby examples of humanity at its saddest. Slaves. Fear clutched her chest. Lowering the binoculars, she said, Those are... It's a slave colony. They didn't put floating cages in the movie for, I'm guessing, production reasons, even though they already had a cage from earlier in the movie. But you get the sense that these folks down at the bottom of the tower, they're not uh, willing residents, willing participants. They definitely seem to be captive in some way. Yeah. I remember thinking years ago when I watched this movie as a kid that it was so obvious that the people were hanging from chains and moved so strangely. I mean, who waves like that? And it seemed like it would be such an obvious discovery early on. I just felt like it was a really bad plan. I think working in the Deacon's favor is that Helen and the Mariner and Enola have never seen Home Alone. (laughs) So they have not been exposed to this particular kind of ruse before. For the longest time watching this movie, I never got the sense that this outpost was a slave trading outpost. I always thought that the people hanging here at the bottom, who on closer inspection are wearing manacles and are chained to the structure, I always thought those were people that were killed by the smokers and they were strung up down here to sort of represent a welcoming party. That was also my impression. I don't recall ever thinking about it as a kid, seeing this movie, but watching it as an adult... Frankly, it doesn't matter whether they're dead or alive. They're in the position that they're going to be in. If they were alive, they'd still be hanging like this. And Helen certainly also has that realization. She's put off by it. She is slightly shocked, maybe not as shocked as I would like her to be. But she picks up what this outpost is putting down. It seems like the spyglass itself, though, is not a common item that people would have. So I could see where from a distance this would be a feasible plan, aside from the fact that he seems to have things that other people don't. Yeah, which the deacon, I'm not sure, has picked up on that yet. Let's see. Does the deacon know that the mariner is a fish man? He does, because he's got the intel from the Nord who met the mariner back in the atoll. So he does know that the Mariner is a fish man, but I'm not sure yet he really realizes what that means, which we haven't really been shown what that means yet either, because we haven't gotten the underwater scene yet. Right. So we as viewers have gotten to see, yeah, he's got stuff that nobody else has. We don't really know the extent of that yet. And the Deacon even less so. So the Deacon wouldn't necessarily expect him to have all of these fancy items right or the ability to understand what's actually happening here faster than the deacon would want him to are you at all disappointed that the mariner has a regular telescope and not two specially made lenses that he wraps in a piece of leather and then ties in place with a string a la the telescope in prince of thieves (laughs) i well i think that would be an upgrade even though it's I think technologically a bit of a downgrade from what Helen is holding in her hands, but functionally, I think it would be an upgrade. (laughs) I feel like from a film standpoint, though, that would have been a great homage. It really would have. Oh, absolutely. Any sort of callbacks. I'm a big fan of, especially when they're out of universe callbacks to other things that actors have done. They just feel really fun to me. They do. I always enjoy seeing that stuff. So does YouTube. They love that stuff. (laughs) (laughs) From Helen's perspective, there only appears to be three people up there on the top of the tower. We're obviously looking at a bit of a lower angle, but there's a lot of negative space. We're looking through this tower. And so it's a bit surprising when we cut in close to reveal that the traders are indeed dead, that there are a whole gaggle of smokers hiding up there. I think it stems back from... The production where they built this tower on top of a buoy and 
sure, it would stand upright on its own. But if you put too many people up at the top like this, it would probably tip over. And there was that story about it tipping over at least once. The YouTube channel, The Atoll, mm -hmm. noted that if you're looking at this outpost close up, they're probably tied to the dock. Which, I mean, come on. That only makes sense. It does. There are some very obvious chroma key composite shots coming up. Yeah, that's the smart part of production. You don't do things you don't have to do for cost and safety. Yeah. I don't know. I was kind of reading about this production set, and it sounded like there were a lot of really dangerous elements to it. So I wouldn't be really surprised if they didn't throw a bunch of people up there and just hope for the best. <laughs> they certainly did seem to want a certain level of authenticity when authenticity wasn't really needed. <laughs> Production-wise, it was a big ask everything being out on the water and that's the whole setting of the movie yeah that's a lot there are so many tricks of the trade that could have made it easier but less authentic and they seem to have eschewed some of those tricks of the trade i feel like for an outpost floating in the middle of the ocean in open water really structurally that's probably not the direction i would have gone it sounded like Kevin Costner made a lot of concessions for creative value, though, <laughs> and he fought for it. Yes, he did. He made the movie he wanted to make, and he made decisions. <laughs> Executively, he did. Yes. <laughs> I have to wonder about the Deacon's decision to kill all of the, what we know because of the novelization, are slavers and string up their bodies as opposed to killing the slavers, throwing their bodies into the ocean, like sinking them or something like that, and then having his smokers put on the clothing of the slavers and just going with a disguise situation as opposed to a, uh, I'm going to call it a meat puppet setup. I actually had that exact same thought. I thought that would be so much easier to just take their clothes and just have real people standing at the top instead of doing all the stringing up and messing with it. It just seemed so badly planned. I was really disappointed in the Deacon. It does seem quite labor intensive. And it also opened up the possibility, which is what happened, for an odd vibe to be coming off of this thing, which everybody is feeling like something's not right here. What This is weird. It's wrong. What's going on? To be suspicious and to investigate those suspicions. If they had just replaced the people manning the outpost with his own people, they could have gotten the Mariner to actually dock. Mm -hmm. Well, and if they could have spoken Portuguese, right? Yeah. Yeah. It makes me wonder how many people actually do speak Portuguese outside of Mariners and slavers. Are the smokers necessarily fluent? I don't know. I feel like as far as the plan goes, it's kind of the hallmark of a supervillain like the Deacon, though, to have a really unnecessarily elaborate plan <laughs> that's really bad. And that doesn't make any sense. It's come up in the past, maybe not on this podcast, but in other places, that you don't necessarily know what people's passions are or what their prior jobs were before the apocalypse. And obviously with Waterworld, we're enough generations out that no one in this world lived on land sort of thing. But it makes me wonder if there is a smoker who has a real passion for puppetry and he saw this as an opportunity. Oh, hey, boss, I've got an idea. Let's try this. And the deacon <laughs> would see that as, oh, that's a good idea and not an incredible red flag that you've got a crazy serial <laughs> killer amongst your crew of murderers. He's encouraging them to live their dream. Yeah. You know, if anything, that's a mark in the positive column for the deacon that he allows his underlings to explore their passions in life. Fantastic leadership qualities. <laughs> I actually believe that more than I believe that this was Deacon's idea. I don't know. The Deacon is a touch fanciful, but he is also quite practical. Aside from being the leader of the bad guys, he has some decent leadership qualities. And I think practicality is one of them. Mm -hmm. And his strategic thinking is how he chose this outpost to intercept the mariner and it was very he thinks that we're gonna go this way because he thinks that we think he's gonna go this way so we're just gonna go this way and 
it's completely convoluted, but it worked because mm-hmm. he had a good strategic mind. So I don't think strategically this was great. <laughs> so I think this was somebody else's idea. Yeah. There's a scene that we don't get to see where the smokers roll up on this place, guns a blazing, they kill all of the slavers. And then as they're setting up this ambush, maybe someone just got bored. Like I said, there's probably a puppet enthusiast in their midst and said, well, you know, all of these other guys, they're sinking their boats down and getting this net ready to close in on the Mariner's boat. You know, I'm sitting around doing nothing. I've got time on my hands and a bunch of dead bodies on the ground. I might as well do something creative with it. Oh, my goodness. Like the moon moon of the smokers. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, people do crazy things. That's why we brought you two on. You're our resident experts on uh, people doing crazy things. Crazy things. <laughs> We've learned a lot so far in our year of talking about these crazy situations and people. I don't find it far fetched that someone would get bored and decide to make a human puppet at all. It's not, not unreasonable. Yes. <laughs> There's always a non zero chance. Speaking of non zero chance, I was on. Instagram the other day and I saw a meme that said the chances of your cat stealing your boyfriend are super duper low but they are non-zero and it was a meme of a cat stealing a boyfriend (laughs) it was adorable my boyfriend tries to steal my cat but he's also a taxidermist so it's not always a good thing (laughs) so he knows about meat puppets right yeah kind of okay they know a thing or two (laughs) they've seen a thing or two I'm a bit charmed by how the deacon has a pair of binoculars, but he's holding them just up to his one good eye off center of his face. I immediately thought, man, I bet he would really like to have the telescope and they could have traded had things gone right. I do also love the back and forth with the circular lensing, which has been a theme of sorts that we have noticed throughout the Mad Max movies that we have reviewed previously is that we get the circular view when we're looking through telescopes. So we get it in this movie quite a lot too. And in this scene, we get it from both sides, like looking at each other. It's fantastic. To say nothing of the third scope that we get, the periscope down below. Oh, that's right. This clip is a smorgasbord. Smorgasbord? Smorgas? Smorgasbord. Smorgasbord? With a G. Gorg. Gorg? Again, I don't know anymore. Listen, we get a lot of chances to look through scopes in this clip, and that's great. Even with my inability to speak. Yeah. But yeah, the Deacon's gamble of choosing this outpost as the place to head off the Mariner at the pass pays off because he's looking through the binoculars. He sees Enola, and he is very pleased. Yes, there's my girl. Howdy, darling. Come on in here now. He's almost like a little kid. He's got kind of that giddy excitement. Mm Mm-hmm. It's super disturbing. Uh, Every time the deacon comes on screen, I'm delighted. He is quirky and weird and dark and really fun to watch. I agree. He's got an amazing aesthetic. And I don't think anybody could have played the deacon like Dennis Hopper. He did a great job. I agree. I'm not sure anybody could have. So I want to duck back into the book because there was a bit more after Helen realized that this was a slave colony. She, of course, exclaimed oh, hey, this is a slave colony. And the Mariner picks up on the next paragraph saying, he didn't reply. Was this a surprise to him too? He certainly seemed to be studying the tower and its inhabitants carefully, suspiciously. Or, and the thought chilled her thoroughly, had he brought Helen and Enola here to sell them? Amidst all of this suspicion of Helen looking at the tower, the deacon looking at them, the thought is running through Helen's mind. Are we going to this tower, a slave colony tower, so that the Mariner can sell us, which is a bit worrying for someone who's been in a precarious situation this whole movie. It makes me sad that the book goes to that place. It feels too real that women and children are abducted and tricked into sex slavery. That happens all the time, and it's really sad, and it's really hard to stop, and... It's an epidemic, especially in the United States, but really, really all over the world. I'm glad that that wasn't included in the movie. As explicitly, yeah. Yeah. 
from another perspective, though, I feel like that level of uncertainty that she is experiencing throughout the whole film adds a bigger dynamic to her character. So I'm kind of sad that they didn't, but also from your perspective, also glad that they didn't. She's already been sold once before. So there is a track record with the Mariner of him taking his passengers and selling them off for scraps of paper. Mm-hmm. We all know how I felt about that. Yeah. Not great. <laughs> Not great. I know that the book kind of orders things a little bit differently. I think in the book, they haven't really bonded the way that they have at this point in the movie. Is that correct, Rick? Um, They've had about the same. About the same? Okay, well, then it doesn't really make sense. I know that their relationship is still newly civil, so you don't cure uncertainty because you've had two or three good interactions with somebody that uncertainty sticks around for quite some time but we only have so much amount of time like we need to go on a certain path and that feels like a setback at this point narratively these thoughts about oh no is he going to sell me again should not be present from a character arc standpoint they should be past it at this point yeah i also don't like two instances of him potentially selling them. Honestly, if I had to choose between the two, between the Mariner literally selling Helen to a drifter for sex and, oh no, did he bring us here to sell us into slavery? I'd rather see into slavery because the Mariner selling her for sex just was so bad. It was so bad. It went too far and had... A bad outcome did nothing to forward the plot or relationships. There was no point to it. So if we had removed that scene and in this scene, her confront him and say, hey, did you bring us here to sell us? You jerk. And she yells at him and she defends herself and he has to defend himself and say, no, I did not. Something's not right here. We need to keep investigating. I would rather have seen that. So that is coming. That exchange is a conversation that happens after this accent scene. Oh, it does? Because we are watching the extended edition. Okay, good. Then it's redundant. They already had this situation about ownership and selling. Just another reason that that scene where he sold her to the drifter was not needed. I do think that the kind of exchanges that they have regarding buying and selling people or women in particular do add a lot to the movie and kind of showing what the world would be like in a situation like that because it's such a harsh place and everybody's just trying to survive barely on anything those situations would probably arise in the first exchange you can really see the mariner's guilt even though obviously i don't think it was good at the very beginning but it kind of just gives his character a little bit more shape too so do you think that it dawns on Helen immediately like when we see Helen pulling down the telescope from her face and she's got a bit of a surprise look on her face do you think that thought of being sold again starts right then I think so I'm not sure necessarily if it's a good thing that they downplayed the slave colony aspect of it in the final cut of the film because they really gloss over it and the main thing is here Everyone on the tower is dead. The smokers are here. That really dominates the action scene coming out because it is the most integral thing. And I really understand why the confrontation between Hell and the Mariner that we're going to see in weeks to come is cut from the theatrical version. And one of the reasons why it took me so long and reading the novelization to realize that it was a slave colony and not just a trading outpost, like the Mariner says earlier. Right. It's interesting that... When there is a skirmish or a battle, lots of things get thrown out the window. She has suspicions about the intentions of the Mariner to sell her to this slave outpost. But right now, that doesn't matter. Right now, there are bigger problems. They need to defend themselves. There's going to be a battle. So it's very interesting to see what people are willing to overlook in times of war. Mm Mm-hmm. Dipping back into the book, I've skipped ahead a little bit. The Mariner moved to the edge of his ship. The woman trailed after him, saying, Why did you bring us here? Quiet, he said, and leaned out to have a look overboard. The water gleamed with the faint but telltale iridescence of oil, 
a sure sign of a go-juice boat, and a strong indication of Waterworld's prime proponents of such vehicles, smokers. But there was no sign of any boat, let alone a go-juice boat, let alone a smoker. Still, the mariner had to follow his instincts. Out here it was the only thing that kept you alive. So he left the woman behind to babble her questions to the wind, and moved to the starboard hull where he ducked below deck into a crawl space. Within the womb of the ship, he removed a floorboard and exposed a wet well open to the water below. Nearby was his portable periscope, which he thrust into the wet well. At first, all he saw was water. What had he expected? He guided the periscope to give him a full view of the main hull, and then, jarringly close, he peered into the hideous face of a begoggled, breathing tubes up the nose smoker. Okay, begoggled is a fantastic word. <laughs> Oh my goodness, that is just so begoggled. Oh, it's great. It's great. I like how they do it here, where they've got the periscope spinning around. You see the Mariner doing his little waddle duck movement as he spins in a circle. And then we see the three jet skis underwater. And I feel like I would have preferred for that periscope to swing around and then boom, right in the face of a smoker. And maybe the periscope knocks into him or something like that. The smokers are bumbling evil guys, and so they're allowed to be a bit goofy. I really love their breathing apparatus. It's like a snorkel setup, pretty much. And they have got this long tube, which seems like a flexible tube and some sort of floater up at the top to mm -hmm. keep the top of it above water. It seems pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And in general, I'm a really big fan of the tie it underwater situation that they've set up for themselves here. Visually, it's a lot of fun. It produces the pop out of the water thing. Yeah, it's pretty great. It's simple and clever. And I think that's what I most appreciate about it. I think that what I like the best about that scene is basically just even underwater, you can see they can't contain their excitement. They're just ready to like fight no matter what it is. It doesn't even seem like it matters what the plan is ever. Just whatever the deacon says, they're ready to go do. It communicates their level of devotion. And that it is quite high. Going back to like the, the passion thing, like they're just having a good time. They like doing this. They like being on their jet skis and any time they get to be out there on the water doing their jet ski thing, they're all about it. Probably the closest any of them have ever come to a bath either. <laughs> yes. They're probably the nicest smelling, which is weird because salt water it does like wash off sweat and stuff, but it also leaves behind other things. So it's not a great bath, but yeah, it's a lot better than I think most of the smokers get. At the end of the day, this is going to be an interesting story for the other smokers that you're hanging out with back at Smoker HQ. I'm like, oh yeah, I was hanging out underwater today and I had my little breathing snorkel all set to go. I appreciate that these guys aren't too deep because I know there is a maximum depth where snorkels are effective. At some point, the water pressure just doesn't let you breathe right. So I appreciate these guys are fairly high in the water, low in the water. I don't know. When you're measuring depth, I'm not sure what the proper terminology is. They're high in the water? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know that this water world came about because of pollution, but the water, I think, generally speaking, is pretty clean mm -hmm. they're not that far below the surface so they should be pretty visible right i guess it all depends on where you're looking if you're not expecting your enemy to pop up from below you you're probably not looking down into the water quite like that we've had a lot of scenes earlier in this movie where the mariner is scanning the horizon and he has never before used this periscope very true so the deacon and his plan with the waving dead people, he doesn't necessarily need the Mariner to come dock. He just needs the Mariner to come past the submerged ski so that they can pop up and they can create a perimeter around the Mariner. So this is an interesting question. Is the Deacon waiting with his goons in the trading post plan A, and does that make the jet skis in the water plan B, just in case he starts running. I always felt like the jet skis were more going to be to like secure the boat, maybe surround the boat, you know, afterwards. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if they knew the extent of his 
sail release apparatus either <laughs> and how fast he could get away. So I don't know if that's right, but that's what I always thought that they would be more like they get close enough. They can get control of Enola and Helen and the Mariner and then kind of let the jet skis just surround them. It was an all in one, I think. I go to a one two punch, as it were. Absolutely. Something that I wanted to note, I honestly don't remember really where it is in the minute. The Mariner is starting to get super suspicious about what's going on with this outpost. It might actually be after he sees the submerged smokers and Helen asks him what's going on. And for the first time in their relationship that Helen has been on the Mariner's boat, the Mariner actually tells her what's going on. He tells her that it's smokers. In the past, he would have just ignored her. Mm -hmm. And she would have been forced to come up with her own plan that may or may not have worked. We've literally had that situation before. But instead of that, the Mariner actually says, hey, it's smokers. Go do this thing. I think it's the very last thing in these two minutes. He says, go sit over there and man that gun. Like, oh, gee, they're working together and communicating, and they're going to come out with a better outcome than the last time this happened. (laughs) Gosh. I feel like it said a lot to the fact that she ran right up to him and asked him what was going on. It made me feel like, you know, her living her life mostly on the eighth hole. She had this wall of security and a lot of small securities where he's always lived out there on sea. And she really looked to him like as a leader in that situation where she'd been trying to portray her independence the entire time throughout the movie. But in the face of an actual danger, they looked right to him and it made me feel like they really trusted him deep down. That's kind of the only choice they had. Yeah, that's true. Helen has started to observe that every time the Mariner goes below deck, it's not because he's looking to hide. It's because he's got some sort of trick that he's going to pull out. We go back to the airplane situation. He went below deck and Helen thought he was running away, which is why she got the harpoon on the plane. But then he pops out with a gun when they were complaining about not having any food to eat. He went down below deck and he came out with that two headed harpoon fishing rig. In this instance, he went down below deck and by now Helen has realized, okay, he's probably going to come up with some sort of crazy contraption. And so when he pops out, and just goes to the helm, it makes sense that she would walk up and be like, hey, what's going on? And then we get that dramatic turn to camera, and he just says, smokers, and starts deploying sails. It's nice to see the boat as a whole, and also the individuals on the boat, working really as they should. Because he is the captain. It's his responsibility to take charge, yes, all the time, but especially when there is danger. That's his job. Mm -hmm. and he's never been shy about taking that lead. He's just crappy at doing it. But we see some improvement in him this time, some actual growth, I dare say. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, we are, you know, well over an hour into the movie, well over halfway. We need to start seeing some growth in him. Takes a long time to get used to not being alone when you've spent your whole life alone. And we learned, I think it was either last week or the week before, I don't quite remember when, we get some really telling clues as to why he's alone and why he feels so alone. That he has experienced people lying to him, people trying to kill him in his sleep and whatnot. So his current situation is completely understandable. Honestly, for the movie and the plot, I kind of wish that was exaggerated a little bit more. It's a bit subtle for my taste. Yep, he seems to have a really, really, really big distrust for others. And so I think that the only reason that he even let them come, obviously, is because he felt that obligation to them after they saved his life. But he still just doesn't seem to be able to get past the need to work alone and having his own system to do things and feeling like they're completely in the way. And I think you're right. It showed a lot more teamwork in this situation than we'd seen before. And they need all the teamwork they can get because the smokers are so dang coordinated. As soon as the trimaran starts turning and the deacon realizes something is up, the deacon signals down to the Nord, the Nord fires his gun into the water, and the other smokers spring into action. It's so well coordinated, you could tell that they probably had a briefing and a game plan 
I'm not saying they had whiteboards, but they probably drew out a game plan <laughs> for exactly how this is going to work. When you hear the bang, you cut those lines, and then we see smokers coming out of the woodwork, popping out of the water, literally left and right, to encircle the trimaran, pulling this massive net. Yeah, this net, it's brilliant. Again, the smoker strategy is just top-notch. They don't necessarily need to cover all the space with jet skis because they've got this net that can fill in the gaps for them. And that's a brilliant way to stretch their manpower. Because one of the tough things about open water is it's open. He could retreat in any direction. Mm -hmm. So that takes a lot of manpower to cover all of those possibilities. That's why in the real world, when we build cities, we like to build them up against mountains and on the other side of mountains and rivers and oceans, because it makes it a heck of a lot easier when you don't have to cover 360 degrees. Mm -hmm. We get a quick shot of the Nord standing up from his crouched position, laying down on the jetty coming off of the trade depot here, and he looks positively delighted. And there are smokers everywhere firing guns at the Trimaran, sending Helen and Enola once again sprinting to get away from the bullets. This delight on the Nord's face? Wow. He needs to put his tongue back in his mouth. He's living his best life, having a grand old time. I think they 100% live for this stuff. Just scaring the crap out of people and hurting people. <laughs> you know, I never considered it before, but I'm sure that this is not the first time that they have pulled this sort of trap with the ski doos being under the water. I'm sure that they have done this before and know exactly how this plan goes and how to set it up and how to make it work. I'm sure they've probably practiced it, which is a delightful thought. So, yeah, I think he's delighting in a plan well executed. But, man, it's a bit goofy. And like, <laughs> like we said earlier, the smokers get to be goofy because... They don't take themselves too seriously. The movie doesn't take them too seriously. I do feel like it goes a, a long way to show that they don't even take the plan as seriously as Dennis Hopper's character does in that situation as the deacon, because he is just completely panicked in this moment where they're just dying laughing. Yeah, that's the luxury that the Nord has being the second in command. It's like being second in line for the throne. You don't really have to worry as much as the person who's actually in charge. Right. There's less pressure. That just means that they get to keep trying and keep trying different plans and having more fun. <laughs> right. <laughs> get creative with it. You're in the post-apocalypse. You got all the time in the world. <laughs> and nothing better to do. Exactly. The Mariner notices that this netting is speeding towards them, and as Helen and Enola drop to the deck to avoid the bullets, the Mariner tells them to run to the starboard side and get in the chair. The net is a very obvious problem. It is a thing that if it manages to capture them, the jet skis would slow them down. I'm not sure that six jet skis attached to a net would be enough to pull the trimaran backwards against the strength of the wind, but it would definitely slow them down enough that the deacon and the other smokers would be able to catch up more effectively and then straight up murder them. Huh. If they ensnare the trimaran in the net, there's nobody else available to jump from the jet skis onto the trimaran. So I'm not sure that they're really meant to be as an, an attacking force, more like as a containment force. Yeah, so you've got the yeah. six jet skis attached to the net. Those are the ensnarers. And then you've got the other jet skis that were hidden behind the trading post that fan out behind the Nord, those are the kill force. I'm sure we'll get to see more of the jet ski action next week, but I'm just kind of wondering how effective a kill force can be when you have to drive your own vehicle and you have to exert a certain amount of attention and devote a certain number of limbs to your vehicle. It just doesn't seem the most effective? If it had passengers, that's what I want. I want them to have passengers who can devote themselves to the attack. I mean, even if they abandon their jet skis and leave them adrift, they have the resources to recover them later. 
That's very mm. true. There is a move that the smokers do that we got to see back during the atoll attack where they will come up alongside of a boat and they will jump from the jet ski onto the boat. And it failed that first time around because the mariner only had to focus on that one guy. And so he was able to kick him in the face before he could climb up onto the boat. But when you've got this many dudes all trying to board you at once, I can imagine you would be hard pressed to cover them all. I'll definitely be watching out for their attack strategy. If they can get that far. If they can get that far. (laughs) Which, honestly, I've seen this movie through a couple of times. I don't remember what comes next. I don't remember how this attack ends. So, (laughs) you will watch the next two minutes next time. (laughs) Yeah. We get to see why they're running to the starboard side. Why getting in the chair is so important. And that'll all just come next week. I never would have thought of that plan. I'm just not that creative. (laughs) And I don't like boats, but I don't think I'd have ever thought of that plan for the net. No, the smokers were somewhat smart in this situation, but I do agree that it was not a well-balanced plan. It leans very heavily on some of their skills and does not capitalize necessarily on all of them. Do you think that you two would do well in a water world apocalypse? I I heard I don't like boats. (laughs) I love the ocean and I love boats, but I am super terrified of sharks. So I don't like to swim in the ocean. (laughs) That's all I think about is what is underneath me. So no, probably not. Yeah, that's incredibly fair. Do you have a preferred type of apocalypse you'd like to find yourselves in? As long as it's like warm and land. Good to go. (laughs) Good to go on any of that. If I can grow some sort of food, I'm all right. I'd take zombie land zombies. (laughs) Like, why would you throw zombies in there if it could be warm and dry with zero zombies? How about water zombies? I think we could take a whole new dynamic here on this movie. They need the meat puppets could just come alive. Oh, dear. Ooh. (laughs) Ooh, I like that. Everyone that goes into the sludge ends up coming back out. Coming back out. Oh, that is so gross. I don't know if anyone's done water world zombies yet. Yeah, I'm trying to think if, I mean, not that I'm well versed on, you know, zombie movies, but not that I can think of. Someone has got to have done a zombie outbreak on a cruise ship. Enough real world outbreaks happen on cruise ships that someone must have made a movie where About zombies zombie happen. Zombie cruise ship? Tangentially related. Minecraft has water zombies. Yeah, they do. And they throw tridents at you. <laughs> Well, and they go they... glub, 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 glub. And it's not great. It's not great. Trident-wielding zombies are definitely a force to be reckoned with. Yes. I also hate when my kids leave their Minecraft on and then I'll be doing dishes <laughs> or something later and all I can hear is these horrible little creepy sounds from the oh zombies. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and I have no idea where they're coming from. And I'm, it takes me a minute to realize that that's what it is. And there's some really freaky noises that come out of Minecraft. Yeah, there absolutely is. And you don't realize how freaky they are until you're unaware of what it is. And it's like, wow, that's a terrifying noise in my house. (laughs) So that's the only water zombie that I can think of. Yeah. Well, they did Sharknado. So I'm sure that water zombies won't be far behind. That's very true. Never count the sci-fi channel out when it comes to original programming. They haven't done zombie natives yet. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) They go in so many different directions. Yeah. Oh, God. I mean, mostly in a circular one, but still. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It is very circular. (laughs) All right. That's enough. Sam and Sarah, it's always good when two drifters meet out on the open ocean that something is exchanged. Could you please let our listeners know where they can find more of your stuff on the internet? You can find us on any podcast platform that you listen to. And we're also on YouTube. They can contact us if they ever wanted to. We can, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the social medias. And we have a website, bigfootforbreakfast.com. Sam and Sarah do a lot of great research. They present it really well and clearly. They have a great dynamic, as you've heard today. So definitely go check them out. We really appreciate you guys having us, too, because it's, it was so surprising that you guys were doing Waterworld since this is... <laughs> It's a movie we really grew up with. We, I mean, we quote this movie all the time. So when you said Waterworld, I thought it was just kind of fate. Because it's not that popular of a movie, some, you know, in this age. It's very true. At this point. <laughs> we have a recurring, what are you thinking about? <laughs> <laughs> and have a smoke if you missed your mom. Nice. 
as for us, come back next week. We will see Helen, Enola, and the Mariner work together to escape the net. We'll see yet another hidden trick from the Trimoran, and Deacon will demonstrate why sometimes it's better to just do it yourself. The Mad Max Minute podcast is a fan project by Rick and Julia Ingham. Waterworld was written by Peter Rader and David Tui, directed by Kevin Reynolds, and presented by Universal Pictures. Mad Max Minute is produced and edited by Rick Ingham. Our opening music is Verdi's Dies Ire by Daniel Batista of DanielBatista.com. Our home on the internet is MadMaxMinute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at MadMaxMinute. And like us on Facebook by searching MadMaxMinute and join our Facebook listener group, Mad Max Minute Beyond Microphone. If you'd like to support the podcast, visit Patreon.com slash MadMaxMinute. Thank you for joining us for Waterworld Episode 52. We'll see you next time.